Hello. This video is for people who are starting out on close-up or macro photography or who are thinking about trying it and would like to know a little bit more about what might be involved. I enjoy taking pictures of flowers and insects and other creepy crawlies that aren't insects like spiders for example. Other people like taking pictures of man-made objects like jewellery or watches but it's all smaller things uh, than we usually pay attention to like people and roads and cars and so on. One of the things that people often want to know about is so what is macro? What is close-up? What's the difference between them? One of the things that you may hear is that a photo is a macro if the image on the sensor, camera sensor, is the same size as the subject in the real world. So if you're photographing an insect which is a centimetre long, then the image is going to be a centimetre long actually on the sensor in the camera. That's okay, but it gets a bit complicated for people who use cameras with small sensors, like I do. And it gets a bit confusing as to exactly what we're talking about. I prefer to think in terms of the width of scenes that are being photographed, because that means the same to everybody. And I tend to think of a close-up as being a scene which is around an inch across, or larger. And that a macro is a scene that is smaller than that. That would mean that most of my pictures of flowers would count as close-ups, and most of my pictures of insects would count as macros. And I think that's broadly in line with the way most people would look at it. So what do you need to take pictures of these small things? You need some equipment of some sort, some subjects to take photographs of, probably some software, although not necessarily much. You need some time to spend on it. You need some knowledge over a period. You need to gain some knowledge anyway. And you'll probably need quite a lot of practice. Some people find they can do this quite easily, but a lot of people, I was one of them, have to take quite a lot of time uh, and effort into practicing and practicing. Uh, some of these things seem almost impossible when you start out, and then after a while it clicks, and you realize, hey, I can do this. This is great. And because it can take a while to fall into place, you do need some patience. Right, equipment. Let's start with a point and shoot. I can use this for close-ups. If I stand about a metre away, use full zoom, what I can see, what I can focus on is about 100 millimetres wide, about four inches, which means that I can use this to take pictures of dragonflies or butterflies or other large insects. And I can also use it for flowers. These point and shoot cameras often have a macro function as they call it, uh, which lets you focus very close to the subject. So now I go to wide angle, doesn't work at telephoto, and I can go extremely close to the subject and, and I'm now looking at um, something like uh, 40 millimetres across. Um, there we go. One, two, three, four. Uh, in this, with this camera it's about 50 millimetres across. The one that I'm actually using for the videoing uh, will go down to about 40 millimetres which is actually the same as we had from a distance. So 
there's no huge advantage to that. Um, but you can use it from a bit further away and very quickly the subject gets, the seed width gets very wide. I'm now looking at the, the full width of the ruler from about this distance which is uh, 300 millimeters. So you can use point and shoot for close-ups uh, but not for macros. Next, let's look at a bridge camera. A bridge camera has a fixed lens which goes from quite wide angle to telephoto, sort of multi purpose, general purpose cameras. And you can use one of these in the same way that I just used the point and shoot. You can take it further away, photograph flowers, dragonflies, crane flies, that sort of thing. Um, and it's also got a macro focusing mode that lets you get closer in. But another thing you can do with these, these have got a filter thread on the front of the lens and that means you can screw things onto them. Now these are called close-up filters. There's four in there. They're very cheap. £10, £15, something like that for the four of them. And there's four of different power. And you simply screw one on the front here. And what it does is let you get closer. And in fact, the more powerful ones of these in this set will let you get down to macro distances. The problem is that uh, the quality isn't very wonderful. They're single pieces of glass and um, they're not very sharp. And they can produce coloured distortions as well. Bright um, green and, and red lines along, along edges. Um, but if you're not quite sure if you want to do macro photography or close-up photography at all, there are a very cheap way, if you've got some camera that you can screw them onto the front of, um, it's a very cheap way of just having a go. Now you have to accept the fact that you're not going to get um, competition winning quality photos out of them, um, but they can give you a feel for it and you may find, oh god I like this, uh, and then you can think about um, what other equipment you might use instead. And there are some people, by the way, who are quite happy with these and just use these uh, close-up filters, uh, as they're called, these close-up filters set of four. I use something very similar to that for uh, my photos of insects. I almost you always use a bridge camera like this and a close-up lens like this. But this one is called an achromatic close-up lens, an achromat, and it has um, two or three pieces of glass in it that mean that it can be sharper and it doesn't have the colour problems that the um, close-up filters tend to have. And again, you, you screw it on the front uh, and you can get closer. Now I've got several of these. Um, and they are of different power and I can go to very small distances indeed. With, with one of them I can get down to a, a, a subject width of um, uh, about three millimetres, which is very small indeed. So bridge cameras are, are, are fine for close-ups and macros if you use something on the end of the lens. Now we have a digital SLR and this is a macro lens. It allows you to get the image on the sensor the same size as the subject in real life. So from about this distance uh, I can 
photograph things that are about 22 millimeters across. It's the smallest scene I can do with this because that's the size of the sensor that this camera has got. With an interchangeable lens camera like this, you can do other things as well. You can put close-up lenses on the front, uh, but you can also put things at the other end of the lens. You can put them at this end. And these are called extension tubes, and they're hollow tubes of metal. And what you do is take the lens off, put one of these on, and put it back, and it lets you get closer than you could previously. And the more of these you put on, the closer you get. If I put all three of these on here, instead of a scene about 22 millimeters across, I can get down to a scene which is about half that, roughly speaking. So that's extension tubes. And you can use extension tubes, this is a macro lens, but you can use extension tubes on ordinary lenses. For example, I've got a um, 15 to 18 to 55 lens here. It's a uh, wide angle um, zoom lens, a kit lens that came uh, with this camera. And I can do the same thing here. I can put one or more of these on here. And that again lets me get closer to the subject and gives me more magnification. There's yet another way you can do this, which is these things. Now, unlike the um, extension tubes, and these are, these are hollow, there's nothing in them at all, um, this has glass in it. It's called a teleconverter. And it goes the same way, it goes between the lens and the camera. Um, but the glass that's in here magnifies what's coming in. Uh, and so you can get a magnified picture uh, without getting any closer to the subject. With these extension tubes, the more extension tubes you put on, the closer you get to the subject. In fact, with some lenses, you can put on sufficient extension tubes that the focusing would actually take place inside the lens, so you can't use it, because you can't get close enough. Um, with these uh, teleconverters, it helps you keep at a greater distance from the subject. And you can use teleconverters in combination with extension tubes. Or you can put two teleconverters together. There's one here which multiplies by 2 and one here that multiplies less by 1.4. You can put them together and it multiplies by 2.8 in terms of the magnifications you get. Another thing you can do with an interchangeable lens camera, you might even be able to do it with a bridge camera, I'm not sure. I've never tried it, but you can take a lens, another lens, you have a lens on the camera, but you take another one and you turn it backwards and you screw it onto the front of the one that's on there and that lets you get much closer to the subject and you can get Apparently you can get very considerable amounts of magnification doing it that way. A bit awkward to use by all accounts. Um, but there are people who produce absolutely fabulous results using that technique. There are people who get really good results with all these techniques. and So you don't have to worry that, oh, I must have, say, a prime macro lens because you need that in order to get nice pictures. You don't. You can get very nice pictures with them. You can get very nice pictures with all sorts of things. Especially if, and we'll talk about this a bit later, um, especially if you do a bit of, of post-processing. There are other sorts of interchangeable lens cameras. Um, I've got one here. This is a Micro Four Thirds camera. It has a lens that comes off and you can put other lenses on. You can get prime macro lenses for these by prime. I perhaps didn't mention that. The prime lens is one that's of a fixed focal length as opposed to 
uh, a zoom lens which changes its focal length and most, most of the lenses that I use uh, are zoom lenses that, um, that you can zoom in and out with. I don't have a, a macro lens for this, this is a, this is a zoom lens, um, but I put close-up lens, it's my achromatic close-up lenses on here and this one's particularly good for very small subjects. So that's cameras. Now, there's also a question of whether you're going to use a tripod or not, or some other means of supporting the camera. Uh, I use a tripod some of the time. Other people use a pole, for example. Well, hold the camera, like this, and they'll hold the pole, there, and that will provide some stability. Your hands shake, everyone's hands shake, and if you're using a high magnification, it's very difficult to actually get the subject where you want it, in the frame. So having some sort of support is, is a good idea. It depends on what magnification you're using. When I'm photographing flowers, uh, a lot of the time I work handheld with no, um, with no tripod and I use this camera with a slightly, with a, a lighter lens on it, um, but I'm, you know, I work handheld, I work one-handed some of the time when I'm in an awkward position, um, I don't know, take photos like that sometimes. Which is incidentally why I like to have a camera with one of these articulated screens. You may have noticed that the cameras that we've seen, apart from the point and shoot, have these articulated lenses. That means that if I'm on the ground, and I do spend a lot of time kneeling down when I'm doing this macro stuff, um, if I'm taking a shot from the ground level, you know, I can point the camera upwards. If I'm looking over the top of something, a bush or whatever, I can still see what's going on. I can't get my head up to, to look through the viewfinder uh, but I can see the screen and also when I've got awkward shots I'm going around the corner of something again I can see what's going on. I find these LCDs very useful. Some people won't have anything to do with them um, and that's fine. One of the things about this macro and close-up photography is just like you can have lots of different sorts of equipment with which you can produce very nice results. Um, there are all sorts of different ways of going about it, like do you use a tripod or not? Um, do you ever work you know, one-handed? Um, everyone's got their own preferences um, and things that work for them and things that don't. I would be a bit cautious if you get some very strong advice from people about what you must do or what you can't do. Um, I'd experiment for yourself and see what works and what doesn't. Some people are very sure about what doesn't work and in fact for some people it does. Um, so tripods, yes, I, I, I'll, I'll put a picture up probably of the tripod, the sort of arrangement that I use, but you can use a pole, as I said, you know, hold on to the pole. You can use a monopod, Again, that will provide you with some stability, but it also provides you with some flexibility as well. I use a tripod, but most of the time I'm not using it as you would normally perhaps think of a tripod being used. Um, but you put the camera on it, you line the shot up, and then you use a remote release to take a picture. Um, I do do that sometimes, uh, but most of the time I've got my hands on the camera the same way as the people who are using a, a stick or a monopod. Uh, and I get some flexibility, uh, some movement, and you can use a tripod, an ordinary tripod. Um, if you shorten one of the legs, you can just use two of the legs and you get this sort of motion. In fact, you can even turn it that way as well, just lift it up on one leg and use it as a monopod. Anything that helps you stabilise the camera a bit is a good idea if you're working at higher magnifications. The other thing that you may need to do, especially with macro, is add some light to the scene. Now, 
There's a couple of ways of doing this. Um, you can use LED lights. I've never tried that, um, but there are some people who, who do that. Um, and you can also use flash. And again, there's various sorts of flash. There are some, for example, that fit on the front here. It's a uh, sort called a ring flash that that's produces a, a circle of light. Um, there are others that have two little flash guns that uh, sit on the front here and that can be moved around, point in different directions, which is very good. You can, uh, you can raise the camera flash, uh, its own flash, and put something on here which pushes the light forward and down onto your subject. You can put a flash unit onto the camera, and you'll notice this thing here. Whatever sort of uh, flash people are using, normally they will provide some diffusion. Because if you just use a bare flash unit of any of these sorts, you will get a rather mm, intense and ugly sort of lighting effect from it, uh, which is not very nice to look at with some sorts of images. Um, and people, a lot of people, make their own um, homemade diffusers um, rather than buying them. Uh, and with a, with a single flash unit like this, you can either put it on the top or you can have a bracket. The camera sits on the bracket and the flash sits on the bracket. You may have a device here that lets you turn this around a bit or move it that way um, so as to get the light as close as possible to the subject. Because the closer you can get the light to the subject, the better it is. Or I've got another one here which sits on top of the camera and it's got flexible things so I can do tricks like use one of them to light the subject up and then point another one at the background um, which sometimes is, is very helpful and it's got a little light on it that helps with um, focusing as well because the light from here can, can point at the subject so that sits on there. Um, so with flashes as with tripods and monopods and sticks, poles with cameras and with types of lenses that you add on the front. There's a whole load of different ways of doing these things and you can start out simply with something very inexpensive, see if you like doing this sort of thing at all and if you do, do some reading, do some research, join some forums where you can talk to people about um, what you want to do and how you might do it, listen to what people say and you'll get different advice from different people and then try things and see where you go. There are lots of options and no one right way of doing it and you don't have to spend a whole shed load of money on this stuff either. So that's equipment. When you're starting out it may be useful to spend some time photographing some very simple subjects that don't move, like a, a, a bottle or a matchbox, it doesn't really matter what, but uh, to let you practice things like, can you get the uh, picture in focus? How far away do you have to be? Uh, what happens when you change the aperture? It's much easier to begin to sort these things out in your mind when you're not dealing with a subject which is about to wander off or is blowing around in the wind. As for subjects once you get going for real as it were, there may be more around than you think. Obviously if you're working indoors you can um, arrange things as you like but I'll concentrate on, on outdoor photography. But some times of year there's obviously plenty around by way of flowers, insects and so on. But you can actually find things most of the year. Um, there may be buds early on in the year. There may be um, colourful leaves on the ground or seed pods uh, in the autumn. In the winter there may be ice or water droplets. One of the fascinating things I've found with close-up and macro is that it's opened my eyes 
to things that otherwise I never would have noticed. And I've taken to moving around very slowly so I can have a close look at what's around. I can remember one time when I spent, I think it was two hours on about a metre and a half um, of a, a roadside hedge. There was plenty enough going on to keep me busy photographing for all that length of time. You may find that moving just a short distance can make a big difference to what you find, as some creatures have very localised habitats. And of course, what you find varies with the seasons, but it also varies with the time of day. Early in the morning, you may find insects sitting around, waiting until they warm up and they tend to slow down towards dusk. And I've found that at night I can see more snails moving around and wood lice and earwigs than I can during the day. So when working out of doors, explore different places, different times of day, go back to the same place in different seasons. All these things can help you extend the range of subjects that you find for your macro and close-up photography. So, you've gone out, you've found your subjects, taken photos, and now you look at them on your PC. Are they good? Do they need anything doing to them? Well, there are some people some very good macro photographers who produce images in their cameras that need very little doing to them afterwards. I'm not one of those people. My photos often do need some um, attention uh, when I come to look at them. Here's one that uh, definitely needs some attention. Well, it's, I suppose, from a lot of people's point of view, it's, it's really just one to throw out. It, it's, it's horrible, it's dark. You can see up here at the top right of the histogram, it's empty. Uh, this is an underexposed image. Well, fair enough. Let's see if we can do anything to it. I'll make it brighter. And uh, there we go. And, hmm, problem is, as I make it brighter, um, this area here and this one are getting a bit bright. I'm going to, um, I think I'll tone it down a bit. The thing is that I really would like to be able perhaps to see what's under here a bit better. So I'll turn the shadows up, make that a little bit brighter. It's made the image look rather flat now, so I'll make the very dark areas look a bit darker. I don't know how much of this you're going to be able to see on the video, by the way. Um, but you'll probably get the general idea. Now, I don't know if you can see, there's a, a excuse me, there's a dark area over this side. And uh, I might, for example, want to um, even that up if I didn't like it. And so I might apply some bit of brightness over that just on that side um, so that it's evened it out. And I'd really like to do something about this. Um, it's it's drawing my eye away from the fly. So what I'm going to do is to uh, adjust this a bit. And then down here, I'm going to pinch some color from up here. And so some of the, from, some of the color from up here is now being applied down there. And I don't know if you'll be able to see the difference. I'm going to sort of turn this on and off. And it goes sort of darker, brighter, darker, brighter, depending on whether I've done that covering up or not. And I could do, I might want to make that a bit thinner, uh, do something similar over here that, uh, again, I could, uh, now that doesn't work, but if I take it from there, hmm, it might work. You can see the outline of the circle that I'm using. So uh, perhaps I'll uh, try that again and make the outline, yeah, make the feathering a bit wider around the edge and again I might mm, not sure whether I like that or not um, oh that's better take a bit of something and and just put it on there to make it a bit darker 
uh, and there's another bit there that might benefit from the same sort of thing. So if I go backwards and forwards again, that area that I've just worked on is darker than brighter. Now I've only done a very rough thing here and you can probably see, you might be able to see an edge, but that's the sort of thing you might want to do. And then there's this yellow area around here. I'd be very inclined to get rid of that. The trouble is I've tried and it's surprisingly difficult in this particular case to get rid of it. So I'm going to take drastic measures and say, right, I don't want to, it's gone. Now the proportions of the image don't look right to me. So I'm going to take this up. I'll just make it so it misses this leaf at the bottom here and perhaps make it a bit thinner there. Now the uh, fly is just slightly too central for me. It is off centered to the left, but I prefer it a bit more. And this bit here is sort of begging to be taken away. So if I go back like that uh, and have a look, now we've got the image looks like that. And if we compare it with what we had before, it's uh, it may not be a wonderful image, but it's certainly different from what went before. Being able to make these sorts of changes, and a lot of them are much more subtle than this. Um, that was a rather extreme case, but um, it's something that I do to my images, and it's something that actually I enjoy doing to my images. I, I like playing with this stuff. Some people hate it um, and just don't want to get involved, which is, which is fine. But you may want to have a go at this, and if you do, you'll need a computer and some software. And as with cameras and lenses and tripods and sticks and poles and all the rest of it, um, there are options available. There's free software, there's paid for software. This is paid for software in this particular case. There is general purpose software like this is. Um, and there's very specialized software that does things like, I mean, there's one piece of software, for example, that you can take a lot of photos, just focus slightly differently, and you can merge them together to get much more depth of field. Not only are there options in terms of what software you use, there are options in, term, in terms of how you use it and what you like your images to look like after you've worked on them. And that's an area, another area in which Personal preference plays a very large part. Another sort of software that you might want to use is something to help you manage photos. You may already be using something like this. But um, one of the things about close-up and especially macro photography is that if you're like a lot of people, and you're like me, you'll have a very high failure rate. I may throw away 90, 95%, 98% of the photos that I take on a particular day. And so it helps to have something uh, to ease the load when you're going through large numbers of photos in some cases for some people, certainly for me. And it's not that the software is going to take any decisions for you, but it may help you. You, know, you can put a number of stars on it, use colors, group them together in various ways, just so that you can whittle them down to uh, a reasonable number and end up with just the, the handful or however many it is that you really want to work on and you think are, uh, are possibly okay. Close-up and macro photography can eat up huge amounts of time as the time you go out and actually look for things to photograph and spend time photographing them and I find that time can uh, sometimes I've spent far longer out there than um, I thought I had you come back in you may spend a long time looking through photos uh, processing photos sometimes can take quite some time and then you may be reading books about this stuff or looking up stuff online, going to online forums, maybe a camera club. You might be making things, experimenting with diffusers, measuring this, that and the other to try and find out what works best, comparing this and that. It can take up an enormous amount of time. And I think you need to put a fair amount of time into it, or most people do, if uh, in order to improve. I've been having a go at this for almost 10 years now, and I'm still learning some quite basic stuff, actually. But this is really just by way of a bit of a health warning. Be aware that this hobby can be 
addictive, and I'm quite serious here, um, and uh, just, you know, take good care for those you, you love and those you've got responsibilities to, um, because um, it can it can take over your life. So just be a bit careful. It helps with close-up and macro photography if you know some things. There's some basic stuff that you may already know if you're into photography about the relationship between aperture and shutter speed and ISO and how flash interacts with that, um, how depth of field works. But um, maybe I'm biased and I just think this because this is the f uh, what I take most photos of, but I've got a feeling that some of these issues are um, a bit more complicated and um, difficult to handle than in other areas of photography. I, I may be wrong about that, but certainly I think it helps to um, to get a grip on some of the basics of the the theory, I suppose you'd call it, of, of what's going on, um, rather than just depending on um, pressing the shutter button. Now, I mean, that's not to some people's style. Some people just you know want to go out and 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 take photos, and and some people produce wonderful stuff doing that. Um, but from again, from my personal point of view, I found it very helpful to have come to some sort of understanding of some of this stuff. So I do um, read on forums um, and look things up in Wikipedia and rack my brain somewhat as to as to what some of this stuff um, might actually mean and, and and how it fits together and how it's relating to what I'm trying to do and, and particularly what I'm finding difficult to do and what I'm finding isn't working for some reason. And it does sometimes help to step back and think about, well, what's actually going on here? Um, and sometimes there are people who can help um, online, for example, um, who've gone through similar things and can explain things to you. And I've certainly found that very helpful, picking up information from other more knowledgeable people. You get the idea. Close up and macro isn't easy, not for most people. Um, and certainly for me, it took a lot of practice for my hands to learn which buttons to press on the camera in what order and simple things like that. And trying to get a feel for how far away I need to be from the subjects and which subjects I can block the light off and they won't mind and which ones will fly away if I do. And there are a myriad of things and it can be very daunting to begin with. Just stay calm, be patient, take it step by step, enjoy the successes you have as they come, which they will, and take your time and enjoy your close-up and macro photography. That's all for now. Goodbye.